Hey, what's up? It's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. So the industry moved from a monolith to microservices, and now we're well on our way back to a modular monolith. Was it worth it? Did we learn anything? Well, that's a conversation William Brander and I had. He's from Particular Software. If you're in the .NET space, they are the makers of Service Bus, and that's the kind of conversation we had about around these topics. If at any point during this conversation, you have your own thoughts, opinions, make sure to join the conversation by leaving a comment. Here we go. All right, so one of the things I wanted to bring up was kind of this this swing that if you're old like me, I'm not saying you. <laughs> and me. Um, Chronologically kind of, gifted. Yeah, where we see this kind of swing. Everybody notices it if you've been around long enough. I think it kind of seemingly happens in the, like the seven-year range. I don't know why. That's just the number I come up with where – we kind of see like the tides turn a little bit, kind of swings back to where we kind of were somewhat yeah. in a slightly different way. I think the biggest one that we can talk about right now is where we went from quote unquote monolith. And then we had this hard swing in, I don't know what year it would have been, probably like early, like 2010, 2011, somewhere in there, around there, maybe to microservices, whatever that means. And then now, I guess even a little bit, maybe 10 years later, somewhere around there, we're to being said, said, okay, microservices are bad or they're very difficult. There are all these downsides, which we can get into. Well, maybe yeah. I think that's inaccurate. Maybe the implementation details are kind of there. But now we're into, hey, let's go back to a modular <laughs> monolith. Obviously, I'm assuming you've noticed this, I, I guess, as well. Um, where do you think it stems from? Where does it stem from? That's a that's a very good question. Um, I don't I don't know where it stems from. I think there's there's a lot of frustration with engineers as we try and solve these problems. We we come up with ways that that seem like they're going to be good ways to solve the problems. But then very quickly we hit the limitations of them, and we Actually, no, that's that's not even true. It's not the limitations. And then we realize that we're not solving the right problems with them. So the, uh, let's see, when when I started development, it was, I think as so was just about kicking off. It was just becoming a thing. There were people starting to talk about it. Um, and that was going to allow you to reuse all of your code and all of the systems internally. And, and you could just drag and drop uh, new workflows and it'd be great. Um, and very quickly, people realized that so it wasn't actually solving any of the, the reuse problems because the, the code that we were trying to reuse wasn't intended to be reusable. Um, and I think a, a very similar pattern plays out across all of the kind of swings in technology that we have, where we've got these promises of this will solve all of the problems and it'll be the best development experience you've ever had. But it's not solving any of the problems that are actually problems or meaningful problems. I mean, if you look at microservices, the size of services was never a problem. Why, why did we want to make them smaller? Um, and and monolith, monoliths, uh, which is sort of like a swear word these days, monoliths aren't bad. Some of the best systems that I've ever worked on are, are monoliths. Um, but then people abandoned monoliths because they wanted to do microservices, because they wanted to do solve various problems. And now we've realized that microservices haven't solved anything. And in fact, they make things a lot more complicated a lot of the time. So we, as an industry, are now pivoting to modular monoliths, which, again, I, I don't know if we know what problems is going to solve. So we'll see in seven years' time what the next iteration is. My, yeah. Micro mo, micro monolith or something. Yeah. Give me something of that nature. Um, but having, like... I'm, I'm with you on everything there. It's the thing that kind of throws me off a little bit is once we kind of get into this full wave of say it was microservices, for example, and then like you said, it's monolith almost became a swear word. It's I genuinely curious if you were at a conference, which you probably may have done this. So it'd be awesome if you talk to people at, or even poll people. It's like, what are the physically, like what do they actually think the differences are? Because where I think it, it got way out of or misunderstood, one, on the sizing was a kind of an issue. But what did a service, like what, if you ask somebody, what is a service? 
And then you ask everybody else, what is a service? Do you think you could actually even get a decent definition of what a service is? This is this is fantastic because I I, I remember a, a talk by Don Box probably early or mid 2000s where he was talking about soap and he spent a good 10 minutes discussing the differences between a, a service and an API. And honestly, like looking back at, at that video with a, a lens of almost 20 years of, of progress, I still don't know. Um, I, I, I do know that, that I deal with a lot of people and, and the very first thing they say to me when they describe their, their system design is that they say, well, it's a microservices design. And probably about 80% of the time, that means that they've got uh, controllers exposed via HTTP or REST. Um, and for them, that means microservice because it's just little REST endpoints that you can expose and scale up or down. Uh, for me, that doesn't mean microservices, but that's, I mean, that, that's one of, the, one of the problems with the way we name things like microservices. It doesn't tell you anything about what, what it is. All you know is it's micro compared to macro, perhaps, and it, it performs a service of some kind, whatever that means. So if you, if you stick a HTTP endpoint in front of your database, suddenly you've got a database service, right? For the most part, I would say, although people wouldn't call it that, that's generally what's happening. But I think if, you were, if, if I were to guess kind of the standard answer people would give, or if you really kind of dug into it, is really what you're alluding to, which is I'm really concerned, well, not concerned, but thinking primarily about a physical boundary of something independently deployable that I'm going to expose over HTTP to for other consumers, then that's how they're going to interact with this service. Yeah. I think that would be kind of how I would think most people would think of a microservice is thinking about more of the um, physical deployable nature of it rather than what it actually does. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good uh, a good heuristic. I think a lot of people do feel that way or do think that way um, because it's easy uh, It's easy to reason about the, the physical deployment of something, right? You can think, well, oh, I've got this, this uh, web endpoint and, oh, if I get, if I get uh, Amazon level traffic or, or Google level traffic, I can just scale this endpoint out X amount of times in different physical locations. That's a perfect microservice. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think that's a, a good first impression of what people think when they start trying to implement microservices. So I think this somewhat relates is when I go back to kind of the uh, the original question of like where certain things stem from. In ways, what I'm about to say is I think it's always been there is a really data centric view of everything or like the tendency to be very data centric about um, kind of everything. I'll give you yeah. the example of if you, but it, it kind of wasn't always this way. So this is the example. I was just working on something related to this, which is if you think about like an late or early 90, late nineties, early two thousand server side rendered, whatever tooling you were using for that. And you were generating some web application that was primarily, you know what I mean? You had just, just your browser, really no JavaScript, right? Yeah. Um, where you server-side rendered, say, some table for records in a database. You clicked on the edit link. You went to some form. That was a form that posted. And you just kind of go into that get post cycle, that pattern. When we were doing that, although it was kind of data-centric and then you really could be just generating forms on top of a UI or like a UI on top of your database, there was still more to it than that, though, because your page that you were rendering just necessarily wasn't a single row. It was a composition of a bunch of stuff. You still had like navigation that was still always there. Um, if you were looking at like an order, for example, you may have a link in it that links to the customer or you kind of had that customer information there. There was a lot more composition. Mm. And then somewhere along the way, when we started trans going primarily more to single page or returning JSON as your representation. All of that went out the window where it just became, oh, here's my order. 
no customer information, no way to navigate it, no way at, I had at all how to deal with it. And it's very, very data centric. Where I'm going with all this is I feel like services became that same thing where it's like we have still thinking about really large schemas, but then saying, okay, like this particular table has a service yeah. that's driven around CRUD. Yes. And then that's where you kind of end up where all these, especially over HTTP, we're just making HTTP calls everywhere from service to service, um, essentially what would be a database call. Yeah. Uh, what it used to be called um, forms over databases. Um, I've recently heard the term DDD over databases, um, which yeah. I, I think talks about um, very shallow entities, uh, very very shallow aggregate routes, um, and that leads to having your um, your services essentially being an entity. So give me all mm -hmm. of the order information. Well, what are you doing with that order information? That that's not the question that's asked. So we we're dealing with an entity. So obviously our our service boundaries must be around the order, right? That makes sense. Um, and ironically, uh, the the whole microservice part probably would have should have been better applied there. We should have made the service boundary smaller because if the service boundary is at an order level, remember your, your service boundary should be like a DDD aggregate route. It should be a consistency boundary. Anything inside of that, that service boundary should be consistent. And if you've got an order as your service boundary, and a bunch of other things are happening to orders within the, the process and of fulfilling an order, it's highly likely that you're not going to have a consistent boundary or you're not going to have consistency around the entire order service boundary. But if the service boundary was place order within the bounded context of orders as a, a concept, the service boundary there is smaller, which means that you, you're not getting, you're not you're not dealing with the entity anymore, um, but you've got a higher likelihood chance of having um, consistency around your service boundary, which falls more in line with the DDD aggregate route, I believe. Well, that's interesting too, because I think about, okay, if, if you're concerned, I'm, I'm generally curious of, because it's kind of a comment that comes up a lot is, okay, if you're concerned about consistency, but you have multiple different services that are independently deployed. Um, that's usually the, well, I used to just be, and I have different databases. It's like, I used to just be allowed a transaction. Yep. And now what? Um, and I think that is kind of the somewhat of a problem or some kind of the pitfalls that, that people fall into, but that's not necessarily because you have them in it. Well, it is because you have them de separately deployed. Um, and they're whatever, not using this necessarily the same database. But again, it goes kind of goes back to what you're saying, where was what was the thought into put in what goes where? Yeah, it, it's it can't it can't just be a case of well, these attributes are all related to orders, therefore they all belong to the order service. It 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 cannot be that because there's such a high likelihood that you're going to you're going to have to access data or get information from something that's not within the order entity to be able to make a decision about it. Something silly like um, users at, in this role are allowed to place orders up to a value of $1,000. Um, if, if they're trying to place an order that's above $1,000, they need to get approval from someone else. That's a, that's a business rule, right? But if, if you've got the user roles in an authorization service or something like that and the um, order information in the order service as soon as you try and place an order in the order service the order service needs to go to the authorization service and say hey what role is this person in now uh, from an implementation perspective there's many ways that you can do you can solve that problem without actually having to have a dedicated authorization service but a lot of people unfortunately do end up having things like an authorization service because all of the examples we see about microservices are these very anemic entity type models. Um, we, there's very few good examples of service boundaries that are concise. Uh, what, is, what is the term? It's um, as small as possible and as big as needed. Um, a lot of the examples we see are just 
attribute or entity entity based um, service boundaries, and it's very difficult to learn from those, learn correctly from those. I want to thank William from Particular Software for having this conversation. That was pretty insightful. If you enjoyed this style of video where I have a guest on, have a more of a kind of casual conversation like this, let me know in the comments. And if you want to get in on a conversation about software architecture and design, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server where you can interact with other software developers about topics like this. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.